lady. Hi. Hi. Ah. <laughs> no, that was end of the day sigh. I know that one. <laughs> You've been traveling, right? Yeah, I have actually literally just walked into my hotel room. I <laughs> logged on the computer. I got my glass of wine. And right. I, I got to tell you my sketchy. I can't believe I just did this, but I went to the, the hotels under renovation. I'm at the Westin um, on Fort Lauderdale Beach. And I went to the bar, which was the pool bar, and they only had wine and plastic cups. <laughs> and I'm like, normally I, I could drink it out of a paper cup, but I had a long day. I want a wine in a glass. They're like, sorry, we don't have any glasses. I was like, what? It's a hotel. You don't have glasses. I'm sure there's a glass somewhere. They are like, no. So I walked into someone else's function, like it was a work function. I walked in and I acted like I was part of their their uh, little conference, <laughs> grabbed my wine and left. <laughs> that's oh, awesome. That's crashing like a true pro. A tr- yeah, exactly. <laughs> conference crashing. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Just act like you belong there, get the wine and then slip out the back door. Right. Are you ready for us? Because we're going to grill you, girl. We're just going to ask you to open up all your insides and share them with our listeners. Bring it on. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Hi, everyone. I'm Jamie. And I'm Amy. And this is Clever. Today, we're talking to interior designer and television personality, Tanya Nayak. She was born in India and raised in Boston, Massachusetts. The daughter of an architect, she grew up surrounded by a creative family. Tanya attended Boston Architectural College for her master's in interior design and found her way to the TV screen before she even graduated. She launched her namesake interior design firm in 2005, where she focuses on residential and commercial spaces, including new condo developments and restaurants like Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. You may have seen her on shows like HGTV's Design to Sell or House Hunters on Vacation, which is basically like my dream job. Yeah. Or Food Network series Restaurant Impossible. So let's talk to Tanya. My name is Tanya Nayak. I'm based in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm an interior designer and a television personality. I love all of it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so we like to start at the beginning. I know you live in Boston now. Is that where you grew up? Or talk to us about your early childhood and your family. Yes, so Boston is home for me. I was born in India, so my parents came Right over from India, we grew up in Boston, so that's always been home for me. It's nice because all the shows that we do, as you guys know, in, in the home decor or restaurant decor world, we get to just go to the sites. So we're always traveling. So I never had to leave Boston, really, other than like short stints here and there in New York and L.A. for six month period at a time. So you were born in India. How old were you when you moved to Boston and what was the reason for moving yeah, so my my dad's an architect, super brilliant guy. He went to MIT on a full boat scholarship. So that's what brought him here to Boston. And then I was actually conceived in the States and they happened to be in India for a vacation visiting <laughs> family. And I was born there. So <laughs> that's why I was born there. But I grew up my entire life in Boston. But interestingly, I was the only non-white person in my entire school. So definitely had some challenges there growing and and not just non-white but it was like Boston Irish you know so it was was an interesting childhood (laughs) yeah can you can you go into that a little bit what is it like were people sort of fascinated by you or did you feel like you were shunned or how did that manifest fascinated is not the word I would use (laughs) (laughs) They are definitely not fascinated. It's funny. And I'll preface by saying this. I just went to my 25 year high school reunion over Thanksgiving. And I love everyone I went to high school with. Like we, I really had a great school as we got older, but when they're young and this is so interesting because I, I remember when I used to watch Sally, Jesse Raphael as a kid mm-hmm. and they would have like confront your bullies from your childhood. I used to actually Im- imagine myself on that show confronting the bullies because it was so bad. I mean, and I, I don't fault them for it now. I, I more fault their parents, you know, for not teaching them about diversity at all. But they just didn't know any different. Like they didn't know any better. They really didn't have much diversity growing up. So they're pretty brutal. And I guarantee most of them, if not all of them, have no recollection of it. I think that looking back, they would never even recall the names that they called me or, you know, threatening to want to fight me every day after school just because I was not the same. 
So how did that affect you? Did you retreat or did you grow this really thick skin or were you like defiant? Like, I'm going to show you guys. Like, how did that come out of you? Kill them with kindness. I mean, did it make you scrappy? Yeah. What happened? Yeah, you know, it's so weird. I I think that I did take the kill them with kindness approach because I was a little bit of a pussy. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I didn't want to get beat up. <laughs> so I was really nice to them. And eventually as time went by, you know, I got to junior high, high school, I became that cheerleader girl. And you know, you know what I mean? Like started to gain a little more popularity as I got older. So people sort of forgot about it. But I'm like, actually really grateful that it all happened. I never got beat up, which was good. Like it was always threats. So I never got I never <laughs> got up in a fight. But I, I'm glad that it happened because I think it made me more compassionate as a person, you know, and uh, this TV world is funny, right? Like people get big heads really fast. It's just that won't happen with me. That blows my mind how that happens to some people. I'm like, what? What about your DNA just metamorphosized it's when you got so a job weird. in TV? It's so weird how different they become. I mean, and honestly, like I look at big movie stars and they seem more down to earth than some of the, the personalities that you see on like cable television. And it's just kind of like, I don't know where, where or why. Uh, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. And I think the entertainment industry tends to attract people who have kind of an innate insecurity or who kind of want Hmm. a certain validation. And not everyone, definitely not everyone. You don't sound like one of them. But sometimes when they sort of seem to be getting that validation through a TV show, they just eat it up and let it it change them. Yeah. Yeah. But you mentioned becoming more popular and being a cheerleader in high school. And I saw that big mall hair tease bangs photo of you (laughs) (laughs) on Instagram. So what was your teenage experience like? Were there more challenges or it sounded like things were getting a little bit better or more and more easy for you? Well, first of all, that hair was my every day. (laughs) That was my every day. I was there. Aquanet all over. You know? Totally. And Mm -hmm. I'm telling you right now, no wonder people didn't like me. (laughs) No, are you kidding? That hair took real craftsmanship. I can tell. (laughs) It's an art. Maybe that's where I first discovered my creativity. (laughs) It's it's definitely where I discovered mine. Artful haircuts, decorating my room, for sure. (laughs) Totally, right? So I grew up in the South Shore of Boston, and there was always a rivalry between South Shore and North Shore. And like my hair... I entered a high hair contest where I had like a <gasps> <ball>. No way. <laughs> there, there. Yeah, I won. I, I, I think oh, it's a, my I gosh. Think at the top of my head. <laughs> That's hilarious. So wrong. It's wrong on so many levels. Do you know what I did to this poor um, ozone layer? <laughs> it's, my, <laughs> it's my fault. <laughs> Besides the hair, uh, did you seek out any creativity or, or design or art at that time? Oh, Totally. I was always in art classes. And I, I, I actually look back and there was one art teacher, Mr. Pippi, who was so encouraging with a few of us that, it, you know, he really put a lot of energy and time into fostering our art. You know, I used to love to paint. And I know, Jamie, your, your paintings are just so spectacular. And it's oh, something thanks. that I, I feel like I would love to go back to. You know, I, I've let it go a bit. I used to sketch all the time and, and now I've just because of design and the precise nature of everything, I'm so adept to CAD and our generated like SketchUp, you know, Revit, that kind of stuff. And I, I, feel, I feel like the art has been lost a little bit of just freehanding and sketching and painting and it's so freeing and it feels so good, but I'm starting mm. to suck at it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's an expressiveness and a gestural quality and a spontaneity that can happen with with a brush stroke or with a pen or with something sort of, you know, impromptu. And I'm sure you can relate whenever you make something or work for a client or do something as involved as interior design or architecture, there's so much planning that has to go into it that the spontaneity, you don't lose it completely, but it does drain a lot of the spontaneity right away from that. And so having that really sort of loose creativity is just an exciting kind of juiciness to keep your life going with. It really is. And I'm actually disappointed that you know, the girls in my office, they all laugh that I come into the office after traveling somewhere and I have five cocktail napkins with different back bar builds or, you know, feature walls or whatever that I've sketched out and I hand it to them. I'm like, here you go. <laughs> Let's put this in CAD and figure it out. And 
I wish I actually saved them all so that I could have made a little cocktail napkin book out of it because they're they're the best. I don't know what it is about putting a pen to a napkin. That's magic. It is magic. That's a great idea. You should save them from now on. Yeah, I will. I will. (laughs) (laughs) So you talked about your father being a talented architect and going to MIT on a full scholarship. And he's a creative influence of yours. I mean, like paint the picture for us for how you and your dad kind of interacted together and how you witnessed him doing his work that may have seeped into your psyche, formed an impression on you. Yeah, well, you know, my dad is the stereotypical Indian father, you know, and they always say, you know, the stereotypes are doctors, lawyers, engineers. And so he falls in that engineer category. Very strict growing up. Very, very strict. Like, it's interesting that with the strict nature, when we were little, he used to give us for Christmas the how to doodle books, you know, like how to draw cartoons, how to draw three dimensional boxes and pens and pencils and and sketchbooks, that was always a Christmas present for us, which I loved, you know, I loved it. But then as I got older, I wanted to follow his footsteps in architecture. I remember taking drafting classes in high school, and I was the only girl in the drafting classes, which didn't suck, you know, and I really Mm -hmm. enjoyed that. And then he kind of steered me away from it. He had a small business at the time. So I think his mentality wasn't about the creative aspect of it. His mentality was owning a small business. And I know all three of us know how hard that is and how much time we dedicate to it. So his sort of focus and direction was coming from a small business owner and not from the creative architect side of it. And he was basically like, I don't know if this is a field that you should go into. And so I ended up doing my undergrad in business marketing because I was sort of steered away from the creative aspect of things. And in my mind, all I thought was, I need to do something creative. I'm an artist. Like I need to do something creative. And the only thing in that business world that seemed like it would fit the bill was marketing or advertising or something in that world. So I ended up doing that. And I have no regrets about that because I learned so much about how to market even myself now, you know, my business, my TV career, all of that stuff. But oh, yeah, I think all creatives should have some business and marketing education, right? Because our brains are just they they're it's two different sides, you know? And, yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I, yeah, I ended up doing that for like six years. And I went to school, I worked at various different jobs, you guys, I was like a hearing aid technician for Miracle Ear. <laughs> like, there was not a job that really fit me. But I was bartending the whole time. So I luckily I made a fortune bartending. So I never felt like I had to stay at a job that I hated, you know, because I was still able to pull in some money because I was bartending. And so I finally reached this, like I had this super Oprah aha moment. And I just I was lying in bed one night and I just thought, you know what? I am too fucking young to be doing a job that I hate for the rest of my life. Amen. Right? And (laughs) I I, honestly, I feel like there are people that are 60 that should feel the same way. You know, it's not, it wasn't that I really was young. Like no one should be doing a job they hate for the rest of their life. So the next day I woke up, like I kind of told myself in the, in the morning, I'm going to get up. I'm going to go to Boston Architectural College. I'm going to apply. And you know, Kids don't tell their parents when they get a a belly piercing or a tattoo or something. Like I didn't tell my parents that I was going to pursue a master's in interior design because I didn't want them to talk me out of it. I was like, I'm just going, I'm going to sign up. I'm going to pay for it myself. I'm going to do it. And that was that. When did you tell them? After I signed up, after I like put the deposit down. And Were they supportive? They were beyond supportive because at that point my dad was like girl what are you going to do with your life like you can't continue to bartend forever you know and he was just like I I want to see you you know do something and and then at that point I think he was just so happy that I made a decision you know like in my it was in my own head it wasn't that I thought they weren't going to approve of it I just didn't want them to talk me out of it like they had the first time you know what I mean Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You didn't want to give them a chance to to try and sway you or pressure you in another direction because then you'd feel bad about it. Yeah. I mean, they're my parents. I respect them so much. I love them so much. And, you know, don't want to give them (laughs) the input anymore. But yeah. So but it's so interesting. You make that decision in life and all of a sudden, like the world opens up and you're suddenly doing what you love. And the first audition for a TV show came through my school website, like email, they sent a blast email to all the students saying that the guys, um, Scout Productions that created Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, 
they were casting for a show for ABC Family, and they thought it would be a really good learning experience if all the students would go and audition. And so I was like, yeah, that would be fun. <laughs> you know, like I thought that, that could be cool to learn how to audition. I was always like a dancer and cheerleader. So I wasn't afraid of getting up in front of people. And I went and lo and behold, I got, you know, I got my first TV gig that way. And this is your big break. My big break. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no idea. Like, and so the funny thing, tying it back to dad was that because it was a show for teenagers, his peers didn't see the show. So he didn't get it. You know, like he's coming from a very old school mentality, education, education, education. And here I am doing a TV show and he didn't get it. Like he just didn't get it. Right. So it wasn't until I moved over to HGTV after that. And I was on design to sell and his friends, wives and his friends, they all started seeing me on TV and they would comment to him. And that's when it clicked for him. And then I got to be on Oprah and that's when it clicked hard, you know, and he was like, okay, all right, I get it. Like you're doing something that it's out of the, you know, it is out of the box. It's not a typical career. I, I have a similar story. I sort of chose a, a more a business route at first, and then it was not a great fit for me. So I ended up studying furniture design, but I was making art furniture, which, you know, isn't really that commercial and my parents didn't quite understand it. And then I ended up on TV and my mom saw my show on an airplane. What? Oh, and that's like so elbowed funny. the woman next to her and was like, that's my daughter. And at oh, that point mom. they were like, okay, now we're proud of you. <laughs> you totally get it. Yeah. And also like they could watch it on their TV at home all day long, but it's hard for them to wrap their heads around the fact that it's on everybody's TVs, you know, it's like on all across the country, you know? So that that was a big eye opener for them. So what was it like getting your sea legs on those first few shows? It's not your typical first job out of school. I found out after my first day on set on Knock First on the on the um, ABC Family show that they said to each other behind the cameras, "Oh boy, I think we might have made a mistake on this." One. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had no idea. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Not like I didn't understand blocking or any of that. And I, I just was kind of talking to the teenagers, but I turned my back to the camera. So now, now I know I get it. <laughs> I get it now. It took me 15 well, everybody years. learns on the job. Yeah. <laughs> True. Did you enjoy those first few TV shows? Did you get the bug? The bug is like the biggest understatement. When the show <laughs> ended, I was crying the ugly cry, like hyperventilating snot running down my face. <laughs> I was like, I can't. I, and at the time I didn't know what a manager was. I didn't know what an agent was. Like I got that show because I auditioned through my school, you know? And so I thought that was the end for me. And I was so bummed, so bummed, like really, really hysterically crying after, you know, we had done the show for two years. And then one of the producers sent me a Craigslist posting and it said, looking for a young urban designer for a new edgy series on HGTV. And so I sent them the link. It was only like a week after our show ended. I sent them the website link to our show and I got a call 30 minutes later. They're like, we would like you to do our pilot. And I was like, let's do it. What? It was called Freestyle. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So the rest is kind of history, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. You know, it's so funny. Like I, I bust my ass with my business so hard because I keep thinking this isn't going to last forever. This is, you know, the TV things. Not, I can't put all my eggs in that one basket. And then it's like, it keeps going, which I'm so grateful for, but I have to figure out a balance in my life. Like, I don't know how you guys do it. I really don't. I mean, can we talk about that for a second? Yes, because yeah. I am riding the blog wave and I'm just like, when is this wave going to stop? Because I got to figure out what I'm going to do next. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to stop, bro. Not at the, the pace Apparently you guys are not. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I am doing so many different things. Some of them are related and some of them aren't. And I'm juggling all these projects that are speculative or, you know, financed or not financed or in development. And sometimes I just really want to punch a clock. Like yes. I really just want to have somebody else make my decisions for me mm -hmm. so I can take a nap. I think one of the hardest things too is just getting burnt out on making decisions. Like I'm tired of making every decision about everything. And sometimes it's like, you just want to call somebody and be like, what should I do? Yeah. Yeah. Dis decision fatigue is my big issue too. Decision fatigue. I love that. Mm -hmm. Hashtag decision fatigue. <laughs> I do. Hashtag. <laughs> I know. And then uh, Amy, do you have kids? I know Jamie, you do. 
I do not have kids. No. Yeah, okay. So I don't either. I actually, Amy, I think you and I have such a like a mind blowingly similar path in life. We're going to, we're going to need to carry our conversation on even further. Yes. I absolutely think so. But throw kids into the mix and Jamie, I don't know how the hell you do it. Every minute of my time is like pre-scheduled for something. I think the really important thing for me is every day I find something to do that's 100% for me or that's self-care related because otherwise I go into like a quick spiral of like crabby aggression. <laughs> but how? So that's my question. Yeah, I just set aside the time and that's the that's the time I need to dedicate to it. And I, I tell people I can't schedule a meeting at this time or you know, and, and I, I, you know, my husband is really supportive and we, we balance our household and parenting duties 50 50 because we both have full time jobs and we're both a parent. So it's a 50 50 thing over here. And that's huge, though, the whole huge. support thing. Yeah, because Absolutely. I, like, I don't know what I would do if my husband was not supportive. I mean, I'm gone. You know, when I was filming The Great Christmas Light Fight, I was gone for almost six weeks nonstop. You know, you have someone that's not supportive. It's it's really hard. I dated musicians for a long time, like touring musicians. And it was kind of easy because they understood the travel schedule. Mm -hmm. Right. But then nobody was home or we just pass each other in the night. (laughs) (laughs) And it was a really awkward like never saw each other kind of situation, but at least we both understood it. Right. I don't know what's better. I mean, your husband is a restaurateur, correct? Correct. Yes. And I think okay. it's a great situation actually, because he works like crazy too. You know, he, he works so many hours, but he's actually not traveling for it. So yeah. in a way it's, it's a nice balance because someone is always home, <laughs> you know, and, and we just got our little, our little pup Flynn, our little guy. So oh. Brian feels like a single parent. <laughs> but that does sound like a nice mix because you've got one rock who can, or the pillar of support that can kind of stay at home and hold down the fort. But you guys can also talk shop because you clearly kind of understand each other's businesses a bit. It's actually amazing. You know, in the way we've evolved, we both started out. He was my manager at the club that I was bartending at. I I actually hadn't even started design school yet. So we we go back 15 years. Mm. I know it's crazy. And so when we both started, he, I I bust his balls all the time because he was wearing (laughs) khaki pants and like, oh, just brutal, like Oxford button down shirts. And (laughs) now I I like adore the way he dresses. He's got a very like old guy hipster look, you know, (laughs) shabby beard. But back in the day, I don't know. We we started off together without the big picture in mind and the way we merged and melded together where I went to school for design and I worked years and years and not doing anything in the restaurant realm, you know, in hospitality. I was just doing HGTV and houses and and that mm. side of design. And then mm-hmm. he was moving on to opening his first nightclub. I remember I asked if I could meet with the designer that worked with him and we just sat and we chatted and I was like, oh, this would be my dream. I wish I could do this. I would love to do this. And then Brian has nine restaurants now. And so as he moved on to his second one, that's when he kind of said, listen, do you want to try to take a stab at it? The reality is he didn't want to pay a designer. So I'm no dummy. I I get it. (laughs) I was like, yeah, I'll take a stab at it. But I, I got to learn how to design restaurants and I was doing a show on HGTV called Destination Design. And my producer from that show jumped over to Restaurant Impossible. And he was like, hey, listen, we're looking for designers. And I know that you design a few of your husband's places. Like, do you think you'd be interested in, in doing the show with us? And I was like, yeah, I'll give it a shot. You know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And then it went great. It was like the best marketing and best experience, best dysfunctional family experience I've ever had with this far <laughs> possible. It's like all of it was just an incredible experience. We're going to take a quick break to tell you more about our sponsor, Parachute. Hey, Amy, you know what I like best about working from home? Mm-mm, what? The fact that I can work in my pajamas all day. Hashtag no pants. <laughs> Guess what? What? I'm not wearing any pants either. Ah! (laughs) Today, dear listeners, Jamie and I are recording Clever in the comfiest thing ever. Robes from Parachute. Yeah, I feel relaxed already. Do you feel more relaxed, Amy? You know it. (laughs) Uh, uh, (laughs) Yes, I do. So I had always bought my linens at 
big box stores or chains. And I had no idea that Parachute was so affordable until I did my bedroom makeover on Design Milk. And now that they launched a bath collection, I was all over that. They've got towels and bath mats and shower curtains and even rings and liners. And these bathrobes, which are super soft and fluffy, by the way. And this is important, Jamie. They're lightweight, which means I can walk around the house and it won't like swing around and untie itself. (laughs) And they're so comfortable. Yeah, that's a good point. We all want to be comfortable, right? So for me, I like to be in my comfort zone so I can get creative. But everybody always says, oh, you have to step outside of your comfort zone. But I feel like you need to know what it is first before you can propel yourself outside of it creatively. So when I'm ready to draw or something, I want to be in the coziest, most comfortable place so I don't need to worry about anything else and I can just focus. Yes, removal of worry is key. I like that with Parachute, I don't have to worry that I'm sleeping with my face down in a bunch of nasty chemicals and dyes because all of their textiles are OECOTEX certified. And I'm extra comforted. My soul is comforted by the fact that for every Venice bedding set purchased, they donate a life-saving malaria bed net through nothing but nets. That's awesome. I know. So go to ParachuteHome.com now to stock up on their new bath essentials and head on over to Clever Podcast on Instagram to see pics of Amy and I podcasting in our parachute robes. So you've done, oh my gosh, you've done so many shows. Destination Designer, remember that one? You did another one that was uh, Vacationers? All house hunters on vacation. Uh Uh-huh. Ugh. I was always so jealous of all of those people. It was a dream gig. We would fly to these vacation destinations. I didn't have to build anything. I didn't have to design anything. All I had to do was tour these families around to these gorgeous houses. And they would pick a winner, get an all expense paid vacation. It was literally like the dream job. So speaking of dream jobs, have there ever been any nightmare jobs or like crazy, gross, uh, like absurd stuff going on on the set? I want to know like your wildest stories. God, I have so many on the knock first show where it was all teenagers, we moved into it as the show went on, they wanted to sort of elevate the age. And so we had what they called YADs, which was young adults. <laughs> so they were like 19, 20. And so, but some of them, a lot of them lived in their parents' houses still. So we went into the room and we we're clearing it out. And it was some kid out in LA. And I, I'm like, what is this? I'm like holding it in my hand. And I'm like, what? I just had no idea what it was. And it was a, it was a rubber plastic vajay, J. What? <laughs> Ooh, like a flashlight or something? Yes. Yeah. Yep. It <gasps> was. And I was holding it in my hand because <laughs> we were trying to clear out the room to get it ready to start the <gasps> remodel. So yeah, that was one really fun experience. Did he see you unearth his, his rubber vajay, J and did he get embarrassed? He was not in the room. Thank goodness. Oh. <laughs> I, I was like oh my god <laughs> it's disgusting it is a very weird experience going into all those different people's homes though I mean it's just so wild how different the standard of living is for so many different people it? it's kind of yeah. cool too like you get this little voyeuristic approach I'm always blown away both with the restaurants and with the houses how they know you're coming and they don't even clean up sometimes. Yeah, I know. I feel like an anthropologist really, because I get to study all these people. So up close, you know, Yeah, it's amazing how different we are within the home. It really is. And some people, I just, I just do not understand how you can live like that. I just don't get it. Totally. And it's not a, it's not a poverty or a class thing. It's just a disgusting thing. It is. You're right. It's just, I I don't care about anything. Like these. Yes. I don't know. I I went into one house and I just being from India, we always take our shoes off when we go into anyone's house. It's just what we do. Right. So whenever I would go to scout the houses on design to sell, I would take off my shoes at the door and I'm walking in. I take five steps forward. This person has probably never seen a broom or a vacuum in the entire 20 years that they lived there. My feet were coated in dirt and, and fur and dust balls or whatever all stuck to my feet. So I like quickly took five steps back, brushed off my feet, put my shoes on and continued on with the tour. It was so gross. Clearly your survival skills are in place. You, you spotted it quickly, put your shoes back on. <laughs> okay. So, so moving on to your creative process, you have done a lot of interior design for different types of clients, homeowners, restaurants, you name it. I think what might be interesting for our listeners is to hear just the practical differences between designing for TV and designing for an actual 
client. The designs that we do for TV, there's certain things where the camera angle matters. Right. There's always a gun to your head. Like the deadline to get these things done is always crazy in TV. So can you talk to us a little bit about just compare and contrast what it's like to do a regular job, um, like a real people job and a TV job? Most definitely. So the reason I'm in Fort Lauderdale right now is because I'm designing, I'm working with the Roots Chris Steakhouse company. They have about 200 locations and they're revamping them all. They're adding new store locations and they want them all to be completely unique of one another. So here Mm. I am for a renovation process that we started like six to eight months ago. Actually, we started it over a year ago. It got put on hold and then it got picked up again. And now it's finally at the final stages of the design. So that can you imagine in a TV world like that just could never happen. So I get antsy because, you know, we're trained now, right? Like from doing this TV stuff, we're trained to have it done. Like mentally, our brain is like adjusted to fast makeovers quick turnovers Mm -hmm. so so fast and i just feel like i have this like spinning rolodex in my head okay that won't work we can't get that okay here's the next thing let's do this instead yeah (laughs) and i think it may but you know what i think it's a really good thing for us as designers now in also like the i'm using my air quotes in the real world (laughs) because we will make quick decisions you know like you know how the relationship is between designers and builders contractors it's not always a love relationship. They don't (laughs) always love us because they think that we slow down the process, but if they're smart, they will embrace it and understand that we're there to help them move things along so that their clients can have some help making decisions, you know, and for us being on television, it's elevated even more because we're used to making quick decisions and moving on with it. No, that's not going to work. Okay. Here's the answer. Let's go (laughs) next. I think that I've gotten to the point now with, the broad scope of a restaurant where I know what's going to make an impact and what's not going to make an impact. I know where they should spend their money and where they shouldn't spend their money. And being married to a restaurateur, it's money that comes out of our own bank. So I know firsthand what is money well spent and what is stupid money, you know? And I tell them, I tell my other clients besides my husband, you know, I am the one that's telling them, I don't think you should do that. I think it's going to cost too much money. It's going to be too time consuming. You should, you know, how about if you're willing to cut the curve here a little bit, maybe angle that out straight, it's going to cost a third less and, and get done a lot quicker, you know? So there's certain things, unless they really love it and they want it a hundred percent, I'll back them up on it. That sounds like a special skill that you have is to make decisions quickly or be able to walk into a situation and identify like, okay, this is what can be done. This is what's going to work with budget. And then just making those decisions quickly as they come. Yeah. So what about working with your husband? Is that ever like a pain in the ass or is it always smooth sailing? Oh God, the first time. <laughs> The first <laughs> restaurant almost led to a deal later. <laughs> I don't think it's going to work out. It, our first restaurant was tough because here I was new at this whole design mm-hmm. hospitality thing. And he had partners that he had to answer to. And so, you know, their assumption automatically was, you know how it is as a designer, we get blamed for everything. <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so I was like getting pointed at and to be honest now in hindsight looking back I was new at it maybe I was doing a lot of mistakes I don't know but it was a tough position for my husband because he was trying to have the backs of the partners but I'm his wife and he has to have my back too and there were just challenging moments there where I was like I actually dragged his ass to therapy we did two therapy sessions and then I was like yeah all right I think we got enough out of it like we both were like okay I think we're good you know and we were and ever since then now like all the the restaurants we've done together has just been a great like a really amazing experience I mean he's great he understands me I get him and so it's been good no complaints <laughs> I have to ask did you pick up some tools in those two therapy sessions or even outside of therapy that you guys still employ to get through those difficult moments when you're on a job together so remember this is a guy that that grew up in Boston and <laughs> it, Bostonians are not typically known for being very, like big chatty, tell your feelings kind of people, you know, <laughs> sensitive communicators. <laughs> right. And, and I'm a Bostonian, so I can say it. So he's not a real like d- dig deep into his emotions or tell me how he's feeling kind of guy. And one of the things that he said was that he felt like he was not appreciated. And I thought, like, I really it never dawned on me. I don't know. I just didn't occur to me that, that he, that's how he felt. 
And so now I think about that a lot and, and I make a, a real distinct effort to make sure he knows that he is appreciated and everything, you know, and vice versa. He does the same for me as well. So that was, that was a bit of an eye opener, but as far as tools go, I just think over the years, we've learned how to communicate better. We just, we talk now before it was a little bit like things would just get bottled up inside. Communication is so important, but I, I think it's actually pretty typical that people don't feel appreciated and the other person has no idea that the other person's not feeling appreciated. And so I think we could probably fix almost all of the world's problems if everyone just went around letting everyone know how appreciated totally. they are. I say, it, I say it to the girls in my office. Uh, I'm always like, guys, listen, things are going to get tense. They're going to get frustrating sometimes. We're going to have deadlines and we're going to be tired and cranky or you might not be happy with something I may have said or done but I'll never know if you don't tell me and I said all I want to do is make sure you guys are happy if we're like we're a good team and we're working together great you know but if something is on your mind and it's bothering you and you don't tell me I can't help you like I can't fix it for you so Mm -hmm. we got to keep that line of communication and it's worked so far I have an awesome team like I love them You're a television personality and you have a thriving design studio with a great team that you just mentioned. So that sounds pretty successful. What's your personal measuring device? How do you know that you're successful? What feels like success to you? Oh, it's so weird that you're asking that question because I've literally been asking myself that lately because, you know, along the lines of what we were saying earlier, where we're all juggling so much and like, why do we keep doing so much? Like, when is enough enough? I don't know if I know the answer. Like, am I successful? That's a good question. I don't know. Because I mean, what is, I guess, defining success is really interesting. And if I were to define success, I would say having a family and having balance, like work-life balance would be successful. And, you know, like we've had our challenges. It's not something I, I try to keep private or anything. But yeah, you know, we've, we, we, definitely went down that road of IVF numerous times and, and it didn't work. Yeah. I mean, it's literally, it's, I actually feel so fine. I I would love it if it all worked out and if everything kind of magically happened, but after a while, you're kind of like, all right, I don't don't know if this, (laughs) if this thing's going to work anymore. So, so it's fine. It's, it's uh, sort of the God's will, I guess, if if you're going to, you know, put it into any terms to make it as easy and simple. So yeah, I think that would be nice to have some kind of balance and not to say that we couldn't go down the route of adoption or anything like that, which is something that I definitely think we think about, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. You know, I really do feel a kinship with you. I don't have any children either. And it's not necessarily by choice. It's just sort of the way life worked out. I didn't go through IVF, which I'm sure was just its own emotional roller coaster for sure. Yeah. But I have had to reconcile myself with, it looks like it's not in the cards for me, at least not biological children. How do you feel about that? You know, I went through a period where I was not okay with it at all. And I really had to grieve that, you know, it's still kind of an emotional topic because I have a maternal side that is kind of desperately trying to find an an object or an outlet. Right. It's interesting that I didn't even think about this when I wrote this question, but it kind of coincided with my reconciling myself with not having biological children. This redefining of success for myself went from, you know, how comfortable I can be, how happy my family can be, you know, how effectively I can raise my children to be pillars of society. It went from that to like, how can I contribute to society in the most meaningful way while I'm here? Isn't that, it's so interesting, right? Like, mm. I, I sit there and I think sometimes, you know, I, I think I'd be a great mom. And, you know, I wish I did have that opportunity, but because it hasn't been in the cards for me, I'm not entirely giving up yet. I'm 43 turning 44 um, in February, but I do feel the limit. Like I do feel like I'm reaching that point where it may not be too late for me, but I've seen women have babies 49, 50 years old, but I don't know if I could handle it at that point. You know, I just feel like I'll be tired. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but yeah, you do feel like there's some way that you want to be able to see a legacy live on a little bit and, and give good to the world in, in some way. Yeah, giving good to the world. I mean, so that's that's kind of where it landed for me is I used to think of giving birth as 
as babies. And now I, I've really channeled it into giving birth to ideas and shepherding them from a place of non-viability to a place of viability and feasibility. And that feels like motherhood to me. But, well, that, and you know, I think that's ultimately where we have to get to and, and in being accepting of it. But you know, what's so interesting is that there are so many women, literally one out of three or four I feel that have undergone some type of fertility issue. It's that we're waiting a little bit longer in life. You know, we're pursuing Mm -hmm. our careers. It's different. It's a different time. And luckily there's a lot of medical sciences that, that help with this process, but it is fascinating to me how many people I know. Here's an interesting little scenario. So my little quadrant of best friends. And so it's myself and three of my girlfriends. We all are in our forties. And we all have exactly, let's just say we cover the gamut of fertility. So one of, one of my girlfriends, fertile Myrtle, decided she was going to have a baby. (laughs) They tried her and her husband tried for a month, got pregnant. Great. They now have three healthy, beautiful, amazing kids breathe on each other and they get pregnant. Then I have another one of my girlfriends who is an executive producer. She's out in LA. She's got a crazy busy life. Like we do running around traveling and She's not in a relationship. So she finally had the mindset of, look, I'm, I'm now 41 and I should freeze my eggs. So she did IVF and froze her eggs. I have the third girlfriend, also same age, like 41 or when well, she was 40 when she started this, had no, you know, they didn't want to be those girls that they're both single. They didn't want to be those girls that was going to date someone with this intent of, oh my God, we have to move forward. I have to have a kid. You know what I mean? Like they didn't want mm-hmm. that pressure. So she did a sperm donor and got pregnant on the first shot. So now she has a beautiful little girl named Grace. And it's just, it's a remarkable story. She's single. She did it solo by herself. And then there's me in the the fourth part of it where I'm married and we've done IVF six times, you know, and it's just not working. So it's very, it's kind of a case study (laughs) the four of us. It is. I'm glad that you have a network of really tight girlfriends and that you can all talk about this and you all have the fertility spectrum covered. Yeah, (laughs) we definitely do. And I just think you must be so strong to go through IVF six times because you you get your hopes up each time. Um, Yeah, emotionally it is. It's a tough one emotionally for anyone who's gone through it. You know, you you go in through your appointments and things are going so great and they're telling you, wow, everything looks so good. Mm -hmm. This is going to be great. And then, you know, you get to the end of it all and it's a failure, you know, or it doesn't work or, or you get pregnant and then it doesn't, it doesn't survive or whatever the situation is. So emotionally it is tough, but I think that if you, like I, I, live my life on gratitude. It's the, it's what gets me through every day. So I think I'm actually grateful if, if it didn't follow through or if it didn't work, it's for a reason. And that reason, I don't know what it is, but maybe it was going to be very difficult or maybe there would be health issues or maybe who knows what the issue would have been. So I'm just, I'm just grateful that if it didn't make it, then there was a reason for it. Well, that sounds like a really, really healthy way to look at it. And I do think that if you decide to go down the road of adoption or something like that, you'd be an excellent mom. Why, thank you. (laughs) Now I've got my little Flinny, my little bulldog. So he's my baby. That's awesome. Yeah, that little guy is just, he's so, his face is a face only a mother could love. (laughs) (laughs) You've lived your whole life in Boston. Are there things about Boston that you absolutely love and things that you just would love to change about living there? I am a hardcore Bostonian. (laughs) I I love the raw nature of people's words. Every other word is fucking this, fucking that. It's literally (laughs) the most warm, loving conversation is like, I fucking love you, man. You know, like it's it's just, (laughs) it, it is Boston and that's how I don't know there's something really special I have to like hold it back a lot you know being in public eye (laughs) so I hold it back but I I love the seasonal changes I love the honesty I love the architecture I love that there is such an international diverse group of people in the city you know with all the universities there where can our listeners find you online 
So everything on every social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or my website, it's just Tanya Nayak as one word. But my name is spelled totally weird. It's my mother's fault, but she <laughs> threw an I in there. So it's T A N I Y A. And then Nayak is like kayak with an N. So N A Y A K. So T A N I Y A N A Y A K. And that's the same as one word for everything. Well, you are lovely. Thank you so much for for sharing your story with us and also for going off on a few of these like kind of emotional, personal tangents. Thank you so much. This was so fun. You guys are great. And I'm really looking forward to getting together in person at some point (laughs) soon. Thank you so much, Tanya. Bye. She's a sweetheart, that Tanya Nyack. I like her. So friendly and so approachable and just willing to like really talk about anything and and be super honest. You know, she didn't really talk too much about it, but I thought it was interesting that she was the only non-white person in her school growing up and that she was bullied. Like her whole attitude about being bullied was one of compassion Mm -hmm. and strength. The way she kind of painted that picture wasn't of the scars and the wounds that it left on her, but on how it helped her empathize with other people who might be bullied right. and, and how it shaped her. She has a really positive outlook, which I'm sure serves her very well. But it's also really refreshing. It's really nice. Yeah, it sounds like she's kind of made peace with it, but also she said she was grateful for it and that she didn't harbor any ill will toward those people because they were children. And they weren't exposed to other people. Right. And that's the thing. Kids are innocent. Kids don't know. Kids are learning and feeling their way through the world. Mm -hmm. And she did mention, if anyone, she blames the parents. And so do I. You, you, you've got to let your kids know how to treat people. You know, that's not acceptable. But at the same time, it's unavoidable. Right. I mean, it just, it just happens. Some people are mean. Yeah. Kids are the meanest. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they're brutal. They haven't learned to filter them. Yeah, no, yet. no, yeah. they're just brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate her sharing her story about um, infertility and about measuring success. And I, I appreciated you also sharing your story. And I, I didn't chime in because I don't feel like I can relate to that at all because I easily got pregnant with no problem. But I do have a lot of friends who have had trouble too. So I know how important it is to talk about it and how important it is that we as women are not measuring our success by whether or not we have children. Because that's not all that life is about and that's not the only thing we're here to give. I think one of the reasons that was a question I really wanted to ask Tanya is because Success is uh, is subjective, and there are a lot of people that would say just because you're on TV, you're successful. Mm-hmm. And I know that I certainly didn't feel like just being on TV was a measure of success necessarily. Whether we have children or not, it's not like those who don't have children don't have maternal instincts. Right. So then there's those instincts that you have to figure out how to place them and how they best can be used to fulfill your own time here on earth, but also contribute to society. It sounds to me like she is working her way through that dilemma right now Mm -hmm. because, you know, they got their dog and they're considering adoption and it may or may not work out for her. And she's got her partner, right? So she's got the father of would-be children. So I don't know. I I was really interested. I don't don't think she's figured out how to measure success. Mm -hmm. But I think it changes for us. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I was younger, I was like, if I get this job or if I make this much money a year or if I'm able to buy this car and, you know, it was all financial. And as I've gotten yeah. older, it's like it's that that shit's just not important. I mean, yeah, you need money to live and it's nice to have a car that like has a heated steering wheel or whatever. But like, seriously, when, when I look at my life now, I measure it as a whole. Like, am I happy? Am I content? You know, if I died now, would it have been okay? Like, you know, just things like that. And I want my daughter to have a good life. And that my goals have now become goals for her and not just for me. Right. And I also think it's important that your your definition of success keep changing. Because what happens when you feel like you are successful? Right. What's next? How do you keep challenging yourself? How do you keep growing? Mm-hmm. And how do you 
evolve that definition of success so that you are kind of testing the limits of what you're capable of. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe on Mars. Maybe I can. Maybe, maybe they're go going. Mars. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Mean, I'm thinking about getting a ride on that thing. Wait, can you podcast from Mars? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if they have internet there yet. Or maybe they already do. Maybe they're They've way more advanced. they probably already launched a satellite by now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she sort of lightly touched upon the idea that some people who get into the TV business kind of grow giant heads and too big for their britches right away. Mm-hmm. And it's really mystifying to her. And I could tell right away that she's not one of those people. But it mystifies me as well. I don't understand how people can like sort of change their colors so quickly. But it happens. One of the things you said that I I think immediately was a good way to put it is people who seek approval from others or who are insecure and need other people to tell them that they're great seem to latch onto that. And once they get fame, you know, and all these people telling them they're great, then they believe it. And then I think it just gets... I don't know. They just uh, grow these big heads and think that they're, you know, hot shit. And I guess they forget how they felt, maybe, or they forget that uh, the reality. You know what else I think it is? I think either they believe it, or the problem is, is they don't believe they it, still and they feel need like it. a fraud, and they need they're it. They're overcompensating they for their overcompensating. Ins- yeah, yeah, that could totally. totally be it for sure. Well. I am pleased that Tanya does not seem to be one of those people at all. No. She seems like her, her center of gravity is very much in place. Yes. She's one of the good ones. I agree. Compassion and gratitude. We could all use a little bit of that these days. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes and see images of Tanya's work at cleverpodcast.com. You can also connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We love hearing from you. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modal of Your Studio with music by L1011.